Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar, I am Dr. Rama Devi, a Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy from Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences. We will be talking about middle ear today. Let us look at a case scenario which depicts the importance of knowing about middle ear. Baby X with cold and running nose for over a week developed fever and started crying, pulling his ear lobes. By the next day, the baby started, sorry, let me repeat it. We are starting uh, today's session with the case study, which will highlight the importance of the need to know about middle ear. Baby X with cold and running nose for over a week, developed fever and started crying, pulling his earlobes. By the next day, the baby started, baby stopped crying and the mother noticed some secretions in the right ear. The attending pediatrician diagnosed as ASOM with tympanic membrane rupture. What is ASOM? What is its relevance to tympanic membrane rupture? What is the route of infection from nose to ear? Why was the child more comfortable after tympanic rupture? Or why did the child stop crying? So, to attend to today's class, we need to discuss on the following topics. The features of the middle ear, boundaries and contents, ear ossicles, tympanic membrane, muscles, blood and nerve supply, tympanic plexus, mastoid andrum, and the associated clinical anatomy. To talk about the main features of middle ear, middle ear is also referred to as tympanic cavity or tympanum. It is located within the petrous part of the temporal bone and it communicates uh, anteriorly to the nasopharynx through the auditory tube and posteriorly it communicates to the mastoid antrum and air cells through the mastoid aditus. Looking at the middle ear, it can be compared to a compressed cube, biconcave in coronal section, looks more or less like an RBC. If you look at the dimensions, the anthroposterior diameter as well as the vertical diameter is more or less 15 millimeters and looking at the transverse diameter the roof is slightly larger than the floor and it is highly compressed in the middle region. So much so the roof measures around 6 millimeters, the floor measures around 4 millimeters and in the midline we have around uh, approximately around 2 millimeters. So this is somewhat like a biconcave, uh, uh, biconcave structure with the concavity, with the co sorry, let me repeat this. So this is somewhat like a biconcave structure with the convexity projecting into the lumen of the middle ear and gives more or less something like a hourglass appearance. 
even looking at the anterior to the posterior wall, the anterior wall is slightly larger and the when compared to the posterior wall which is more narrow. So, uh, the tympanic cavity, ear ossicles and mastoid androm are located within this and they are fully developed at birth and have the adult size. What are the different parts of the tympanic cavity? Considering the tympanic membrane as the hallmark region, there is a space above the tympanic membrane that is the epitympanic recess or also referred to as attic which contains a part of the malleus, it is the head of the malleus and also the incus that is the head and uh, so a short process. The mesotympanic region is in line with the tympanic membrane and it contains the handle of the malleus, the long process of the um, incus and also the stapes. There is a small portion below the level of the tympanic membrane referred to as the hypotympanum. Coming to talk of the contents of the middle ear, to tell the apt content is the air and it has a mucus lining or the structures are covered with the mucus lining. So, outside the mucus lining, we have the ear ossicles to name them, the malleus, incus and the stapes and then the various ligaments of the ossicles which take part in the uh, joints of these ossicles two muscles, tensor tympani and the sepidius. We have two arteries, mainly the anterior tympanic branch of the maxillary artery and posterior tympanic branch of the stylomastoid coming from the post or posterior auricular artery. There are also veins over here which drain the middle ear. The two important nerves that we come across in the middle ear are the tympanic plexus found over the promontory and the nerve passing across the middle ear um, uh, and going that is the corda tympani nerve. Considering the fact that the middle ear is something like a cuboid structure, we can describe its boundary, uh, boundaries uh, talking about the roof, the floor anterior and uh, posterior walls, medial and lateral walls. So, this is the roof otherwise referred to as a tegment, uh, tegmental wall because it is formed of a thin plate of bone, the tegment tympani which separates the middle ear cavity from the middle cranial fossa. In children, very often it happens that the tegment tympani is unossified and so the middle ear is almost in direct contact with the middle cranial fossa with only the mucosa uh, and the connective tissue intervening. In adults, sometimes there is a drainage of the middle ear into the dural venous sinuses, so much so that the infection from the middle ear can directly pass on into the dural venous sinuses through the transmitting veins. Coming on to the floor or the jugular wall, we call it as a jugular wall because it is separated, it lies in the uh, jugular uh, process. So, let me repeat this. The floor is otherwise called as a jugular wall because it, uh, it, uh, it is related to the jugular fossa of the petrous bone. It is separated from the superior bulb of the jugular vein by the small partition of the bone. At the medial end of that bone, there is a small fissure or small opening which transmits that is called as a tympanic canaliculus which transmits the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Coming to the anterior wall 
also referred to the as the carotid wall because the most important structure uh, related to this is the carotid wall. It is very narrow and there is an opening of the canal for the tensor tympani muscle. Below that, we have the opening of the auditory tube whereby this communicates with the nasopharynx. Now, processus cochleariformis is a bony septum which separates the two canals that we discussed earlier and it extends posteriorly into the medial wall where it is related to the tendon of the tensor tympani. There is a thin plate of bone separating the tympanic cavity from the internal carotid artery. This bone is perforated by the superior and inferior carotico-tympanic nerves and the tympanic branch of the internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery over it has a plexus of nerves that is the, um, uh, uh, the nerves which pass, pa part of them forms the carotigotympanic nerves and enter into the uh, middle ear cavity. Uh, so, uh, sometimes if there is an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery, the, uh, the uh, tinnitus is experienced in the, um, um, by the patient. Tinnitus in, is other words, is the ringing in the ears. To talk of the posterior wall, that is the mastoid wall, which is in close relation to the mastoid antrum and the mastoid air cells, there are quite a few structures. So if we imagine this as a rectangular box or a cuboid box, which has been left open, and here we see the, this is a pictorial representation and here we see the mastoid wall. There we see a large aditus or an opening through which uh, the, the epitympanic recess opens into the mastoid antrum. Just below that is the fossa inquidus that is a small depression lodging the short process of the incus. This is a pyramid, a small conical projection uh, which uh, lodges the stapedius muscle and the nerve and at the apex of the pyramid it opens out, it lets out the tendon of the stapedius muscle. Here we have the vertical canal, um, a vertical canal for the um, part of the uh, facial canal which opens out to the stylomastoid foramen. This lies just below the pyramid and at the, um, uh, at the upper part of it lies the posterior calaniculus for the corda tympani nerve as it passes from the lateral wall and comes over here. This is uh, the place through which the nerve enters into the tympanic canal. Coming on to the medial wall, which is also referred to as the labyrinthine wall, this basically separates the middle ear from the inner ear. The most striking feature of that is a, long, a large bulge referred to as a promontory this is actually formed by the basal, first basal turn of the cochlea located in the inner ear and on the surface, surface of that we have the ramifications of the tympanic plexus which might leave behind small grooves. Next to that is the oval window, shall I repeat this once again, medial wall is also known as the labyrinthine wall and it separates the tympanic cavity from the inner ear. 
The most striking feature of that is a large bulge called as a promontory. This is caused by the first or the basal turn of the cochlea located in the inner ear. On the surface of the um, uh, promontory, we have the ramification of the tympanic plexus which might leave small impressions on its surface. Next what we see is the fenestra vestibuli that is a oval window which is basically closed by the foot plate of that stapes. Above that we see the arched prominence of the facial canal as it passes on to continue as the vertical part of the facial canal in the posterior wall. I think I have to repeat that because that thing came in again. Now to talk of the medial wall which is also called as the labyrinthine wall. This separates the tympanic cavity from the inner ear. The most striking feature of the tympanic cavity or of the medial wall is the promontory which is a round bulge formed by the first basal turn of the cochlea. This is grooved by the tympanic plexus um, uh, on its surface. Next is the fenestra vestibuli or the oval window which is closed in life by the foot plate of the stapes. Above that going in an oblique way is the prominence of the facial canal which passes along the medial wall to continue as the vertical uh, canal on the posterior wall. Here we have the fenestra cochlea which is the round window which is um, in front and below um, the promontory and this is closed by the secondary tympanic membrane. Sinus tympani is a depression what we see behind the promontory. It is caused by the ampulla of the posterior semicircular canal. Just at the edge of the sinus tympani and adjacent to the promontory that marks the area for the apex of the cochlea. This is the processus cochlea reformis which is a bony projection extending from the anterior wall. From the anterior wall it extends, it curves and extends into the medial wall and it is over this the tensor tympani hooks over and passes on laterally for its insertion into the malleus. This is a bulge which we find above the facial canal from uh, uh, facial canal. This is formed by the prominence of the lateral semicircular canal. Now we come to the lateral or the membranous wall. The main structure is the tympanic membrane and this uh, wall separates the tympanic cavity from the external acoustic meatus. So it is mainly formed by the tympanic membrane which is um, with its ring and the sulcus and it is there is a squamous temporal bone in the region of the epitympanic recess. Close to the anterior margin of the tympanic membrane there is a petrotympanic fissure which lodges the anterior ligament of the malleus and tympanic branch of the maxillary artery. There is also the canal, anterior canal, canaliculus for the corda tympani nerve as it exits and is also related to the epitympanic part. This is a diagrammatic representation of the middle ear whereby we see the roof, the floor, the anterior wall, the posterior wall and this is a medial wall and we what we have left open is a lateral wall. 
So, this is just a very compact cube like structure and uh, uh, it is very irregular in its size and dimensions. So, giving it more of a uh, hourglass appearance. Having gone through the various boundaries of the boundaries and walls of the middle ear, we see that there are very many nerves which are related to the middle ear as such. So, in the uh, roof, we have the greater and the lesser petrosal nerves. Um, in the floor, we have the tympanic branch of the ninth nerve or the glossopharyngeal nerve coming to take part in the tympanic plexus. In the anterior wall, there is a carototympanic nerve which winds around the internal carotid artery which also takes part in the tympanic plexus. The posterior wall, we see the vertical canal for the facial nerve as it exits, as it proceeds to exit through the stylomastoid foramen. In the medial wall, we see the oblique um, uh, tunnel for the facial nerve as it joins with the vertical canal of, on the posterior wall. And the, in the lateral wall, we see the corda tympani nerve uh, arising from the facial nerve and passing in relation on the medial aspect of the handle of the malleus and passing, um, um, passing backwards and is exiting. Now, let us look at the various contents of the, Italy, uh, of the middle ear. These are the ear ossicles that is the malleus, incus and the stapes. Malleus uh, is, uh, looks like a hammer or it is a hammer shaped bone. It is largest among the three ear ossicles and it has a head, a neck anterior and lateral processes and it is the most laterally placed among the three ossicles. This is the incus or which is anvil shaped which has a head and a short and long process. This is the smallest amongst, amongst the three ear ossicles. The third one is the stapes which looks more like a stirrup having a head, a neck, a two crura and a foot plate. This foot plate fits into the fenestra vestibuli. The malleus and the incus develop from the first arch cartilage whereas the stapes develops from the second arch cartilage. The incudomalular joint is a saddle joint whereas the incudostepedial joint is a ball and socket type joint. Instantly that is the smallest ball and socket joint in our body. All the ossicles assume adult size at birth. Now, coming to look at and the important content from the lateral wall, most important structure that we discussed is the tympanic membrane. It is a fibro, uh, it has fibrocartilaginous rim at its end and it is attached by means of a sulcus. Uh, it has a pearly white appearance, it is oval and obliquely placed 
at an acute angle of 55 degrees to the tympanic flow. The inner surface, on the inner surface, we see the handle of the malleus, malleus somewhere at its middle. That is the region of maximum convexity, which is referred to as the umbo. Uh, the parts of the tympanic membrane are pars tensa, which is a large portion, and pars flaccida, which is also known as the sharpness membrane. This is because the tympanic membrane is attached um, 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 with a, uh, through a sulcus which is deficient at the edge at uh, one end at the upper end where there are anterior and posterior malleolar folds which come towards the malleus and get attached. So, by this region it creates a tense pars tensa and the flaccid pars uh, flaccida. T a tympanic membrane is a three layered structure. It has an outer layer of cuticle, uh, which is a, a stratified squamous epithelium, and it is continuous with the uh, skin of the external acoustic meatus. It is derived from the ectoderm. The middle layer is a fibrous layer referred to as a mesoderm. Sorry, I have to repeat this once again. Coming to look at the structure of the tympanic membrane, it is a trilaminar structure where the three layers or the three germ layers are found very close to each other, one against the other. The outer cuticular layer of skin formed of stratified squamous epithelium, hairless that is derived from the ectoderm and it is continuous with the external acoustic meatus. There is a middle fibrous layer derived from the mesoderm. The, in, the inner layer derived from the endoderm is uh, either ciliated at areas and it has got both columnar and squamous epithelium. To talk of the nerve supply of the tympanic membrane, the outer surface, uh, the upper uh, anterior upper portion is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve and posterior lower portion is supplied by the auricular branch of the vagus. The inner surface of the tympanic membrane is supplied by the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve through the tympanic plexus. To correlate the development uh, and the nerve supply, it is to be noted the external and middle ear develops from the first arch cartilage and justifies uh, uh, it having branches from the mandibular division of the trigeminal. The stapes and the stapedius muscles are developed from the second arch and so they are supplied by the facial nerve. The auricular branch of the vagus, which we find on the outer aspect of the uh, tympanic membrane, is also called as the Alderman's nerve or Arnold's nerve. It is believed, it or it has believed that stimulation of the Alderman's nerve um, uh, by tickling the external acoustic meatus will facilitate gastric emptying. If you look at it in a long way, of course, the, it is a branch of the vagus and probably its action 
uh, is related to the gastric region also because of its long extension. Talking of the blood supply of the maxillary uh, of the tympanic membrane, basically it is supplied by the maxillary branches, the outer part is supplied by the deep auricular branch of the maxillary artery, whereas the inner part is supplied by the anterior tympanic branch of the maxillary artery and the stylomastoid branch of the posterior auricular artery. The out, from the outer aspect, the veins drain into the external jugular vein and from the inner aspect, it drains into the transverse sinus and pterygoid venous plexus. That means, it is directly drains into the middle cranial fossa. To talk of the muscles of the middle ear, we have two muscles, the tensor tympani and the stapedius. The ten tensor tympani arises from the cartilaginous part of the auditory tube and the sulcus tube and in, it is inserted into the upper portion of the handle of the malleus and it is supplied by the an mandibular nerve from where a, a connection comes uh, to the aortic ganglion which does not have a relay over there. It is developed from the mesoderm of the first branch which thereby justifies its nerve supply. The uh, tensor tympani basically acts by keeping the uh, membrane taut. Talking of stapedius, it originates from the uh, pyramidal uh, eminence. Within the um, pyramidal eminence, uh, there is the interior of the hollow, from there it arises, that is rightly aptly called as a posterior wall of the tympanic cavity. It is inserted into the neck of the stapes and it is supplied by the facial nerve. Having developed from the mesoderm of the second branch, the facial nerve innervation is justified. Both the nerve, uh, both the muscles put together helps to damp down the intensity of the high pitched sound waves and there are, thereby protects the ear from loud sounds. If you look at the blood supply of the middle ear, there is extreme ramifications coming up from different branches. Six to seven arteries supply the whole of the middle ear. The carotico-tympanic branch from the internal carotid artery, the inferior tympanic branch from the ascending pharyngeal artery, the anterior tympanic branch from the maxillary artery, the petrosal branch and the superior tympanic branch from the middle meningeal artery, the stylomastoid branch coming from posterior auricular artery and there is the artery of the pterygoid canal. So, we find that very many branches come from the various branches of the external carotid artery. The veins drain into the pterygoid venous plexus and superior petrosal sinus and the, thereby into the middle cranial fossa. The lymphatic nodes are located in the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, parotid lymph nodes and the upper deep cervical lymph nodes where the primary drainage happens. Looking at the nerve supply of the middle ear, it is supplied by the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve which takes part in the tympanic plexus, formation of the tympanic plexus and it is purely a sensory aspect. The vasomotor component comes through the superior and inferior carotico-tympanic nerves 
these are the sympathetic plexus which is found uh, around the internal carotid artery. The facial nerve supplies the stapedius muscle and it is um, basically a motor supply. The tensor tympani muscle is supplied by the mandibular nerve of the trigeminal. The tympanic plexus is a plexus of nerves which we find ramified on the promontory which is located on the medial wall. It is formed by the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve as it enters from the floor of the middle ear cavity. It is also called as the Jacobson's nerve. Then we have the superior and inferior carotigotympanic nerves, which is a sympathetic plexus around the internal carotid artery, entering or piercing into the middle ear through the anterior wall. Then we have a branch from the facial ganglion uh, uh, called as a geniculate ganglion. And this uh, tympanic plexus supplies the mucosa of the middle ear, mastoid air cells and the bony eustachian tube. It is to be mentioned here that the lesser petrosal nerve derived from this plexus contains secretofibr uh, motor fibers of the glossopharyngeal nerve which goes on to supply the parotid gland through the aortic ganglion. I mentioned about the mastoid antrum. It is an air space located in the upper part of the mastoid region. It also reaches the adult size at birth and it is anteriorly related to the tympanic cavity through the aditus and posteriorly it is related to the sigmoid sinus. The roof of that is called as a tegmen, a tegmen antry, which is nothing but other than an extension of the tegmen tym, uh, tympani. The floor of it communicates or opens into the mastoid air cells. The lateral wall is a bony plate that is the supramiatal or the McEwen's triangle. That is an external landmark which identifies the mastoid antrum. The medial wall is formed by the bulging of the lateral semicircular canal. Having looked at middle ear at its various aspects, looking at its connections, the nerve ramifications, the tympanic membrane, how it is held in place and how it maintains the communication or how it uh, conducts the sound, we are able to come to the answers for the questions posed earlier. Somehow it is, it is to be noted that the middle ear cavity is compact and it has got multiple functions uh, like it helps to equalize the air pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane by, uh, by its communication uh, to the nasopharynx through the eustachian tube or auditory tube. So, this becomes one channel for um, the pathway of infection or from the nose or nasopharynx into the middle ear. Then the ear ossicles are connected from the middle ear that is tympanic membrane of the middle ear um, uh, through the stapes through the malleus incus and stapes which is in close contact with the inner ear thereby it transmits sound waves from the lateral 
to the medial aspect of the middle ear into the inner ear. The various muscles, the two muscles that is the stapedius and the incus, um, uh, tensor, me, uh, tensor tympani located over there. The main function of that is to protect the ear from uh, excessive sound or dampens the uh, sound waves and protects the ear. So, looking at the different aspects, hyperacusis occurs that is when there is an increased sound exaggeration or increased sense of feeling of sound when there is paralysis of stapedius. So we noted that stapedius the main action of that was to dampen the sounds. So, damage to the facial nerve or to the stapedius can lead on to hyperacusis. Autosclerosis is a, com a condition where there is abnormal ossification of the annular ligament which anchors the foot plate of the stapedius. So, this impedes the stadial, uh, stapedial movement leading on to conductive deafness. It is found to be a familial condition. Referred pain of the ear can be seen in various regions um, because of its extensive nerve supply. In other areas supplied by the 5th, 9th and the 10th cranial nerve that is even the pain sensation can be felt at the tongue, the teeth, the tonsil and the pharynx. Myringotomy is a procedure where the, an incision is done on the eardrum to drain the secretions from the middle ear. Whereas, myringoplasty is the repair of the temporoman, uh, tympanic membrane done using temporalis fascia as a free graft. McEwen's triangle or the supramiatal triangle is a landmark on the temporal aspect of the skull which marks the mastoid antrum. This is to be used for surgeries in the antrum. Blue drum or when we uh, look through the otoscope, what we see is a blue drum which is indicates secretory otitis media. Now, to complete the question that we had, ASOM is acute separative otitis media which is an extension of the infection into the middle ear which can have various forms of uh, the course can change. It can be immediately relieved by releasing the secretions through the rupture of the ear membrane. So, once the ear membrane ruptures or the um, uh, tympanic membrane ruptures, there is oozing of secretions. The pressure within the tympanic cavity reduces and there is relief of pain. If um, uh, it sometimes heals the natural course by uh, automatically the tympanic membrane getting closed or sometimes it heals with recurrent discharges coming from the middle ear which leads on that is uh, uh, goes on to form the uh, chronic separative otitis media. Very often it is associated with recurrent throat infections where through the auditory tube the, to the middle ear there is a communication. This can lead on to the rupture of the tympanic membrane, meningitis or brain abscess because of its various communications with the middle cranial fossa or thrombosis into the internal jugular vein or dural venous sinuses by virtue of the veins draining or veins being adjacent to the jugular vein as well as to a dural venous sinus. What is Arnold's cough reflex? It is mechanical stimulation of the external acoustic meatus 
which activates the auricular branch of the uh, vagus which can initiate a cough reflex or can lead on to bradycardia and sudden car uh, cardiac inhibition. Thank you.